Hello everyone, this is Chris from the New Syndicalist editorial team. We thought it was important before starting this episode of Talking Shop to give you a content warning that we do discuss briefly child sexual exploitation as part of the subject matter of this episode. This is in reference to the Rotherham child sexual exploitation scandal. We don't discuss particularly any of the details associated with the cases, but some of the political impact and some of the underlying causes that led this to arise. If you would prefer to avoid this, we hope to catch you next time on the next episode of Talking Shop. Hello everyone, welcome to Talking Shop, a podcast from New Cineclis, a resource for trade union activists and organisers. Today we are talking about populism. Yeah, so populism has been a focus for a lot of discussions, and obviously our recent series is focusing on that. Um, Today, I'm going to be talking about populism as a big picture, Um, but just to start off, we're going to just do a quick round of introductions. Um, I'm Dave Pike. I'm a official for the National Education Union. Uh, My name's Chris. I'm an education worker. I also organized through the IWW and what is now NEU. So I'm in dual carder. My favorite color is red. (laughs) And if I was to be a bird, I would be a sparrow. Oh, nice. That's a good choice. (laughs) Is it the Maoist reference or? He wasn't too nice to sparrows. Yeah, maybe that's why. Maybe don't Well, I suppose it could be like the name to authoritarian. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Screw you, Mao. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Cool, cool. And... Um, I'm Lydia. Uh, I organise with the IWW in London. Um, if I was a bird, I would be like a goth parakeet. And I know that like <laughs> the whole point of a parakeet, but I like the noise more than the lime greenness. So I'm going with it. Yeah, I'm not a fan of lime green myself either, actually. I mean, I'd be a crow. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so dark, man. I'm so dark. I'm so, I'm just, oh, I'm just so metal. I mean, that's, that's. My entire aesthetic. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so, I mean, I'll start us off. Um, Part of why we've been looking at populism is obviously the uh, focus on the rise of populism. Now, the issue I have with that is I believe it's an obsessive focus, particularly of the uh, centre of the political spectrum. Um, when we're looking at the bigger picture, one thing that I think we need to take from that is is maybe just take a step back and actually evaluate how influential populism has actually become. So one thing I did when looking at that was looking at uh, last year's uh, elections in Germany, where there was a real focus on uh, alternative for Deutschland or a- AFD really changing the political spectrum and having a huge what was often called a political earthquake where in actual fact they actually only came forth and their political influence didn't particularly increase um and actually in those elections what tended to happen more was people just sort of shifted around in similar spots to where they'd already been um so for example one of the biggest losers was the center left democrats um and a big chunk of their votes actually went to the Greens. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so we should probably clarify that AFD is uh, a party of the right in yeah. Germany. That is Sorry, a yeah. populist. Yeah. yeah. Far right. I mean, probably comparable to UKIP, mm-hmm. right? Not yeah. not quite neo-fascist or neo-Nazi, but yeah, definitely exactly, yeah. anti-migrant, yeah. pro-national identity. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so... If you also look at Belgium and Luxembourg, um, the populist right, the gains of the populist right is actually closely followed by progress being made by Green Pies, um, who in those three countries have also seen their vote share double. Um, And I don't think there's a lot of people saying that the Green Party is a populist force, particularly. Um, So what these... What this means is across Europe, votes are predominantly staying put on the left or on the right, but just shifting from social democratic to more populist left um, and from green and green as well. And from centre right to more nationalistic or populist 
um, right. So there is obviously some shifting of votes, but they're essentially staying in the same place. Um, I think overall the picture of a weakened centre ground is correct. So mm-hmm. there is obviously a weakened centre ground. But I think despite the crows of political nobodies like Angela Smith, and others in the independent group, which I'll get into in a bit more detail later. <laughs> Not bitter at all. <laughs> um, people aren't crying out for a centre party. Um, quite the opposite. There's a mass abandonment of the centre. Um, and I think that's further evidence when you also look at the Swedish general election last year as well, where studies were showing that the main thing, the main change in that was that people just switched parties, not necessarily to a more radical populist voice, but actually that people were shifting their vote and weren't following the same lines that they'd traditionally followed. Um, And I think looking at one thing that we've talked about a lot during this populist series and examined a lot is what The Guardian has been saying, because they have been doing a lot of The Guardian newspaper, um, it's a liberal broadsheet, uh, well, not, not, no longer a broadsheet, liberal paper in, here in the UK. Um, Probably soon not to be on paper anymore. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Dying. A liberal medium. media source. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Maybe um, they'll call themselves a media project, a media like we do, po- oh, yeah. like, like us up and coming ones. <laughs> it's because we're we're so young and hip. That's yeah. why we can call yeah. ourselves a project. <laughs> also, I think uh, while you're a project, you don't need to pay anyone. No, exactly. So, I was yeah. just going to say <laughs> we have no financial viability yeah, at all, exactly, so therefore yeah, yeah. it's a project. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Pipe dream, I think, is probably more accurate, but you know. <laughs> um, so when the Guardians looked at populism. Um, it argues that the centre is being abandoned and the party system, including the left and right blocks, has become more fragmented. And I think that is probably the most accurate thing when we're looking at populism, is those traditional blocks, both in coalition po- politics in the in mainland Europe and in big tent politics here in the UK and in the US. And by big tent politics, I mean large left and right parties that encapsulate a wide range of views. So the Labour Party here, Democratic Party in the States, um, have become more fragmented. Um, This has meant in mainland Europe that old coalition-based establishment just isn't holding water anymore. Um, And in the UK, that's translated to uh, UKIP, independent group, even arguably Momentum, um, and various other liberal scarecrows. But I also think that that old argument that this is because parties of the centre are too PC or too unwilling to talk about difficult issues like immigration, um, and that's why they're being abandoned, just doesn't carry water either. Um, Research that followed the massive swing in the 2018 Swedish election, for example, showed that um, immigration was rarely the main priority for people who changed their vote. So when people had changed their vote, immigration hadn't actually been a main factor. Um, and, then, uh, you know, hopefully we can get into that in a bit more detail later. But um, so I think the next question then is, why are centrists losing their minds? If, if, if populism isn't as politically effective as it's being portrayed to be, why is, why is the centre losing so much ground still? Or why are centrists, you know not able to to comprehend this thing so it it may not actually be fair to say that the populist parties are making huge ground because of these earthquakes uh, or that liberals are waiting uh for just hasn't happened in the electoral change um or for that matter on the streets because you know obviously um one of the more worrying elements of popularism is is uh the strength of the far right on the streets actually i don't really think there has been that much of a strong increase on center right on the streets because we're still seeing that same nationalist and racist forces popping up at similar levels to where they always have and collapsing in on themselves uh splitting starting all over again it's not like there has been a bombastic increase in the amount of um far right protests on the street so although i think it's probably worth maybe bearing in mind um, Mm. that it's a far right internet culture Mm, is 
maybe a little bit more pervasive yeah. than it was in the past. I think you're right that I think um, in many ways the organised far right in the UK at least had, uh, has abandoned the electoral terrain mm. and abandoned the streets, mm. yeah. that being their traditional strategies mm. that they swap between mm. um, depending on how well they were working at different periods of time. Yeah. Uh, the NF obviously mm. having a go at the electoral game in the 70s mm. then switching to street street politics and the BNP kind yeah. of deviating from those two elements. But this internet mimetic thing mm. is a bit, bit of a new yeah. phenomenon. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and certainly in young people, I think mm. it's beginning to have a certain effect, maybe not transforming people into political activists mm. for those ideologies, but sort of digging into mm -hmm. the common sense a little yeah. bit yeah and i think that that i mean maybe that's where we need to get into it in a bit more detail because actually part of part of my criticism of the obsession around populism is yes people are shifting onto commenting a lot of things on the internet and all sorts of different ways and that's that's true of the left and right yeah you know that kind of click clicktivism that online activism rarely translates into meaningful pol real politic strength it just it 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 doesn't it doesn't really have that impact that we would comprehend as real political strength but what it does have is that societal effect and i think that's why you're right there is is that it does have that it does have that strong effect and it's hard to calculate what impact that's going to have um in a longer term way but right now i don't think it is having the impact that the the sort of academic centrist um viewpoint is giving it you know i don't think it is having that impact um and i think one thing that we talked about in our editorial about that focus on uh great men politics just doesn't translate either um you know there isn't there is those people don't exist there isn't that there isn't those great men or women of the center or the uh, sorry of the left or right leading these populist fights that have the same impacts as as previous in previous generations i don't mm -hmm. think um, you wouldn't put trump in i mean i wouldn't like to call trump a great man but <laughs> you don't you don't feel that he fits that category interestingly one of the one of the one of the one of the things is 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 trump forcing the us to change that much yeah, on the grand I mean, scheme of things, point. on the national stage, is there that much of a difference on how the US operates? Yes, it's a change in language, mm -hmm. but is it having that same impact that you would expect a populist leader of the 40s to have? Mm -hmm. You know, is it changing that much or is it is it maybe coming back to this idea of a societal change? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. I mean, he certainly sees himself that way, though, doesn't he? Like, that's what he's modelling himself on, is that Ooh. kind of strong man. Yeah. Whether or not that's, like, yeah, translating into any anything radically different from, like, Bush. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, is it, it not just, different. Yeah, is it not just capitalism, as always, just with less soft edges, really? And, I mean, I think, I think that's the point, is I want to come back to, is that actually nothing really that much has changed what remains is the same cocktail of economic pressures that people face and the forces of centrism simply not being able to talk to that anymore so various different voices coming forward from the left and from the right mm -hmm. trying to come up with solutions for those same economic pressures that have always been there and actually um the center not being able to just simply just not being able to say anything relevant anymore so actually the question of populism is it actually more one of a dialectical one is it more about language than anything else right now mm. um which and, would dovetail with trump quite nicely because yeah, yeah. I, that, I think that's certainly what he offers that's different mm. isn't it it's a yeah. certain style of leadership and rhetoric yeah that really is unprecedented mm. yeah i mean have there been worse presidents yes absolutely yeah um yeah. you know andrew jackson responsible for a policy of genocide towards mm. indigenous people yeah. that's that's pretty up there in mm. terms of diabolical <laughs> residents actually in terms of the policy agenda mm. with the exception of the wall but the, i suppose the wall is just ridiculous right yeah. it's farcical yeah. no one no one i mean in many ways it's it's a joke because actually i'm sure bush 
uh, junior or Bashina would have come up with a much more effective means of mm. closing off the borders yeah. Yeah. than a big wall that everyone can clearly circumvent yeah. and get round. Yeah. Um, and actually, uh, Obama uh, and and Clinton in the various roles that um, Hillary Clinton in the various roles that she's occupied has had very militaristic approach mm. to borders and migration. Mm. Huge, yes. huge investment in border security. Yeah. Yeah, At similar no. levels, and I, I do think that some of the like the centrist and that kind of that side of the kind of the sort of uh, yeah, well, the kind of the right of the the Democrats and people that kind of broadly fall into that camp, they often seem like more outraged just by how vulgar he is than by anything he's actually doing. It's like they're horrified at the kind of aesthetics of it more than the more than anything that he's actually doing which I think is quite telling like they just don't know what to do they just don't know what to do about it and so all they can do is kind of say like oh he doesn't look like us he doesn't sound like us yeah and like that's the problem Mm. for them yeah yeah exactly and and you see a similar I remember having similar criticisms of the left the anti-fascist left in this country's approach to the EDL, where a lot of the criticisms of the EDL came down to, oh, look at them. They're all wearing track suits. Yeah. You know, ah, oh, oh, this, you know, and you just think, really, is 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 the focus going to be the language that people are using? I'm, I'm more bothered about focusing on the actual practical impact of decisions that, that governments and individuals are making. You know, that, that, and I think... And I think sort of coming back to Trump, one of the things that they that a lot of the a new sort of way of looking at it has been to describe it as a new tribalism. I don't buy into that particular idea, but there's a there's an organization called More in Common, which is like a, a super liberal group. You know, it's it's chaired by um, sort of very uh, well respected liberals, um, and they they kind of buy into this idea that actually the reason the reason Trump and other populists are being successful is because it's an I, I, like a return to tribalism, um, mm. which which is more based around ideas of I don't know it feels more like snobbery to me than anything else actually than actually making a realistic uh, calculation of of the economic pressures that drive people to. Uh, vote or vote in certain ways or change their mentality towards other people you know um, I mean, it's certainly true in terms of finding the the kernels of truth within that I mean mm-hmm. tribalism is it's a pejorative isn't it mm-hmm. it's a way of dismissing that politics in another area you would call that partisanship that yeah. actually mm-hmm. we're seeing a split between left mm-hmm. and right mm-hmm. and actually for political systems that's quite natural yeah, it's, a, it's yeah. about having values and arguing about those values mm-hmm. and what i remember through my young formative years protesting the iraq war um, and onwards the absolute frustration mm-hmm. of watching the political process institutionally unfold and they're really being mm-hmm. position about anything that, that actually throughout the late 90s, early 2000s, for about yeah. 15 to 20 years, there was an absolute consensus mm-hmm. around these neoliberal social and economic policies. Yeah. Um, and that just was, that, that was sort of hit on repeat for, mm-hmm. for years and years and years. Yeah. You know, I remember uh, politics seeming the same for a great period of time and those dissidents yeah. within parliament who managed to have a voice always but essentially fighting against their own parties and yeah. being a tiny minority, yeah. Corbyn being one of them and McDonald mm-hmm. being another. Mm-hmm. And street politics always having the mm-hmm. same process of trade unionists or uh, various other social actors basically saying, I can't believe a Labour government is doing this. I can't believe a Labour government yeah. is doing and, and, and politics was like that mm-hmm. for 10 or 15 years. Mm-hmm. And it was incredibly frustrating. Mm-hmm. So... In some ways, it's quite refreshing mm. that actually people are now talking about values and alternatives mm. and what societies could be like, mm. even if that means some visions coming to the fore that are truly quite terrifying, yeah. Yeah. nasty, yeah. Divis- you yeah. know, divisive and, and violent. Yeah, and I think that's one thing that, that 
is right when when people have been evaluating populism is it isn't necessarily a question of left or right populism ultimately it's it's a question of people versus the establishment and the status quo not not offering answers that yeah. that's 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 what's coming out of the experience of populism more than anything is that the center is terrified of populism because they don't have answers to the questions that are being posed by the fact that we're fucking the planet, the fact that that capitalism is a con- on a constantly downward trajectory, the massive increase in inequality, all of these things, centrism no longer has an answer to. And so voices from all the fringes of political experience are coming forward with answers. Um, and I think you can really boil that down into two two meaningful ways that centrists are worrying about populism is that populism is having an impact firstly you know it's upsetting the apple cart and that you know you can you can lump brexit in with that as clearly a populist Mm. as a populist project um in a variety of different ways and you know regardless of your view of brexit it is clearly a populist project you know and you can look at the language that's been used to describe brexit the constant obsession over people's vote people's view you know Mm -hmm. we're doing this for the people Theresa may's um speech last night saying that you know i'm with the people all that kind of language is is fitted in with a populist rhetoric um and even and and from a a more positive left-wing view as well Ideas of nationalism, uh, nationalisation, sorry, are no longer off the table. You know, the idea of nationalising the rail service is, no, is something that three quarters of people support now. That was sorry. Lydia laughing dismissively at the idea of nationalisation. <laughs> <laughs> was it the fact that I said nationalisation or the fact we, that I first said nationalism? Nationalism. Was like, oh, good. This going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, I thought that was you just mocking Dave's nostalgia for <laughs> coal boards and. Oh, just bring back the coal board. That's what I'd say. <laughs> um, that's later. Yeah, that's later. That's that's that's, later. that's in that's the next later. section. Yeah. <laughs> um, but ultimately, I think the point that I really wanted to make is that centrists are terrified of, if nothing else, the dialectical shift in politics. There is a huge change in the language of politics. It is no longer about people like Chukra Muna calling out for national unity or embracing politics of respect. To be blunt, no one gives a shit what Chukra Muna thinks. You know, he is no longer a relevant political character. You look at politics of the last decade and people like Chukra Muna were the future of politics. Yeah. They were <laughs> bland, centrist businessmen of politics. You know, they were box ticking. They were just simply abiding their time because eventually at some point they will be a realistic leadership candidate and eventually prime minister. That just simply does not hold water anymore. Um, One of the one of the really positive things, actually, that um, that the Guardian in its recent research about populism, as critical as I am of it, did was an evaluation of rhetoric that leaders have used and in, one of the most interesting things about it is it sort of pegged leaders on a it gave them a score based on the kind of populist rhetoric they were using if they were using more populist rhetoric they got a higher score etc and interestingly Theresa may erdogan of turkey orban chavez and trump all scored fairly similarly on the amount of populist rhetoric they were using. So my argument, I guess, just to sort of conclude, is actually that the centre ground is collapsing and those people who used to represent the centre ground in a range of different ways are actually just abandoning it themselves and starting to use that language of of populism of the left and the right. Mm -hmm. Um, Whether that started to have a real political effect, I think is a big question, Um, but the the biggest impact right now is that the language of politics has changed how that's going to roll out in in particular cases i think we need to examine more but you know i think that is the where we're at right now Mm. i think there's a really interesting historical parallel maybe with 
what was going on in Europe in the 1930s. And I don't mean a crude one in the sense that people have looked at financial crisis and then mm. sort of said, oh, well, Trump is the next Hitler, blah, 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 yeah, blah. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're things, that, things are very profoundly different in the mm. world that we live in now. But in terms of just on the level of, of the way that politicians put forward their ideas and the way that political parties put forward their ideas, uh, in the 1930s, 1920s, 1930s, socialism had a moral force and socialism was understood to be the idea of the people, mm. much in the idea that sort of populism now, sort of just speaking on behalf of the people, is also now considered to be um, representative of the times. Mm. And there was great efforts of both people of the centre and of the right and obviously of the left mm. to use the presentation, the ideas and the discourse of mm. socialism. You know, there was a reason that um, the, the party that, Adolf Hitler joined um, post World War One was the Workers' Party. Yeah. What did he rename yeah. it to? The National Socialist Project. It was important mm. to have that label in there because mm. socialism was considered to have the be this moral force yeah. that was responding to the quite profound economic problems mm. that Europe was facing. Likewise, in Spain, um, the Falangists who end up uniting around Franco, mm. you know, they they very deliberately and consciously took on the colours of the anarchist and socialist movements of Spain, red yeah. and black. Yeah. That was a very deliberate and conscious choice mm. because they understood that these were the forces that they had to swim within. Mm. Um, and I think, yeah, there's something that seems to ring true that we are in a moment of very deep and profound crisis in many areas, environmental and economic, um, and to some degree, in terms of how the politics is playing out, a crisis of globalisation, mm. that mm. There, are, there are really kind of deep, deep patterns and shifts that... Mean, mean that uh, the kind of globalised world we took for granted in the 1990s is by no means certain or guaranteed for the future. And yeah, that idea of people now adopting a language that speaks to the challenges of the people mm. without really changing their policy. Yeah, yeah, I think mean, that's yeah. the fundamental thing, right? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. speaking the language of it kind of makes mm. sense to me. Mm. Yeah. Um, maybe that's a good point to move on to actually looking at sort of digging deep and looking at the economics looking at the coal board yeah looking at <laughs> coal board. Oh, cool. <laughs> so i'm gonna do a do a marxist now so we've been, we've You're been gonna do one marxism yeah do we've one been marxism. swimming around the superstructure for too long <laughs> and we need to now dig into the deep base to the of sewers. conditions yeah. um, and understand what the determinant conditions are um so it is profoundly challenging to really summarise the economic and social changes that I think have triggered the decline of mm. centre ground um, that, that, that Dave has been talking about. So what the, the, the approach I decided to adopt was to actually look very specifically at an area that, that is familiar to me. Uh, which is Rotherham. I taught, I did my teacher training in Rotherham. Rotherham's not very far from Sheffield, where, where me and Dave. Chris, is. what is a Rotherham? What is a Rotherham? <laughs> the people of London cry. <laughs> yeah, the people of uh, yeah, people of Brighton have come out of their co-ops. <laughs> what is this Rotherham I hear speak of? <laughs> Magical land of Rotherham. <laughs> do they wear flat caps? <laughs> They do, they do, yes. They do I'd never heard of it until Chris started uh, researching it for this podcast. It's really interesting. <laughs> so there you go, we all learn something. Every, yeah. day. Every day is a school day. <laughs> um, so R Rotherham, I think, is very representative of a lot of the trends economically and socially that have been happening in this country at, uh, over the past 20 or 30 years, but particularly since... The economic crisis of 2008. Mm -hmm. It's also a particularly extreme example because the far right has done particularly well there and electorally there's been points where uh, uh, UKIP and B, the BNP before them, mm -hmm. British National Party, uh, what I you know what we should clarify as a neo-Nazi mm -hmm. pretty openly fascist organization yeah. uh, never really I mean they wore they wore blazers and suits but never really disguised the fact that they were a white supremacist organisation. People who wear blazers can't be bad. <laughs> what? <laughs> um, or, or, sort of ha almost had a breakthrough in this area. So a lot of troubling trends. So 
I think to set the set the scene, Rotherham has been an unbelievably consistent Labour seat for a ridiculous amount of time. Um, they shared the vote with the Conservative for most of the 20s, but from the 1930s into 2005, Labour won 60 to 70 percent of the vote. Bloody hell! That you know, absolutely consistently hard, solid, hard Labour seat as it should be. Now the National Front, uh, National Front arises in the 70s in response to sort of new new waves of migration. There's economic challenges as a result of the oil crisis that's going on there as well they have a go in rotherham they run in the 76 election they get six percent of the vote mm. and they drop to one percent three years later so uh during that period there is some economic turmoil but mm. as a manufacturing industrial town mm. the national front just do not have attraction there mm. like they do not they do not have any they make any headway then 2005 there's some movement between Labour and other parties, um, but we we have basically the BNP, British National Party, and UKIP throw their hat in. That the first time they enter, they don't really sort of have a significant political political impact, electoral impact. 2010, so two years after the economic crisis, they've got 10% of the vote. BNP's got 10% of the vote in Fotheringham. Mm. They held that in 2012 um now i know that doesn't seem a lot but for for a fascist organization yeah a white supremacist organization that's pretty scary yeah their vote collapses in 2015 but then ukip pretty much sort of leapfrogs them and, and kind of mocks up a lot of support as well as a lot of maybe conservative yeah. support there and at that point ukip became a real political beast i mean yeah. prior to 2015 UKIP were essentially a joke in this country. Yes, they were, very much. They yeah. were absolutely nothing. They were yeah. a, a group of nut jobs. It's like 2015. Nigel Farage starts to become a popular figure. Um, you know, he's he becomes a regular speak talking head on various different uh, news broadcasts. So they do start to become the forefront, yeah. don't they? So 2016, 30 percent UKIP score, mm. and they take a significant chunk out of Labour by doing that. Um, there's not much evidence that those are Tory vote switching, but they seem to be largely people who haven't voted before or, or former Labour voters. Then we have obviously the referendum and Rotherham votes to leave by quite a large margin, 68% in favour of leave, which I believe is, is well, Sheffield, I know, was a lot closer. Sheffield did vote leave, yeah. but it was a lot closer. And I think it was maybe obscured by the fact that bits of Derbyshire kind of um, come into the Sheffield electoral constituency. Sorry. Sorry, were you just claiming that Sheffield was in Derbyshire? No, they, they <laughs> lump in, they oh, lump in good, bits of Derbyshire. Good, so good. when they do it electorally, especially for a referendum, they, they basically lump in bits of the Peak District yeah. into the Sheffield vote, which... I think, well, my, I, th I can't remember exactly, but I think that tipped it. But a lot of the metropolitan central areas voted Remain. Then Corbyn comes along and it is a complete switch. So where before UKIP was scoring 30% of the vote, Labour, Labour is back then after Corbyn's leadership to around 60%. And... UKIP loses 20% of its vote share in that election. Mm. Um, so there's a 20% swing from UKIP to um, Labour. And so there's lots of things going on. There's obviously a limitation to looking at electoral statistics alone. I think that doesn't explain everything, but there's, a, there's some clear you. patterns and trends. So essentially what is happening in that mid 2000 period that is that is having that such deep impact on the way people behave electorally well the story goes a little bit further back because rotherham as a as a town was a huge industrial center in the 1970s and 1980s it had a huge number of collieries that were closed in the uh in the 1980s to early 1990s so we had brookhouse dington kilnhurst kiverton park Maltby, uh, Manus Main, Silverwood, Thurcroft, Treaton, and Wath, and the Orgreave Coking Plant, mm -hmm. all in all in the Rotherham district. These were all 
central areas in which industrial action was taken back to. You're the, talking the thousands and thousands of jobs across. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and then, and this was accompanied by huge manufacturing bases as well. So you have the the coal industry, all of the industries associated with mining, associated stuff like collieries and distribution of of coal, and also manufacturing that was just in that area anyway. That has essentially been replaced in modern Rothering by call centres in the Dern Valley, which is the, the prime area of job regeneration. So yeah. what were previously stable, unionised, reasonably well paid industrial mm-hmm. manufacturing jobs mm-hmm. are now precarious, poorly paid, ununionised temporary work. Um, the So 30% of new jobs created in these industries are part time. Um, and although it's very difficult to come by specific data, incredibly likely to be on zero hour contracts. Yeah. Um, so this so there's been a clear shift in the type of work that's happening, the investment in the area, and that has a knock on effect on the levels of poverty that exist in this area, which is then exacerbated by the financial crisis. So uh, Yorkshire in the Humber was the fourth highest region in the UK for percentage of jobs paid below the minimum wage. So roughly 37,000 jobs in the region are paid below yeah. minimum wage. Um, recent, more recent statistics um, in April 2018, I remember talking to this about Lydia actually and making her feel really bad about her job. But <laughs> the, the, in terms of uh, high, sort of gross weekly earnings, mm. there's quite reliable information about this out yeah. there. Um, employers are a business is generally quite interested in this stuff so april 2018 highest gross weekly earnings for full-time employees is city of london uh, on average of 1,054 pounds a week mm. um. <laughs> oh, i want to cry <laughs> well you're not earning that <laughs> <laughs> well, this podcast obviously uh, massively supplements my oh, it is. Yeah, yeah. all the all the money we're making from this. But otherwise, Bank, no. Bankrolling our lavish lifestyles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Rotherham, in that same survey, survey had the lowest in the country at four hundred twenty-seven pounds a week uh, weekly earnings, which is just shockingly low. Mm, that's yeah. very, very, and that's an average as well. Mm. So that so in terms of the spread, there are a lot of people who are below. Yeah. That. So part part of the reason is 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 post two thousand eight, uh, the financial crisis. There's a massive contraction in the job market in Rotherham, and in the four years, the the local economy. So what was left of that kind of post industrial economy, service sector based economy, basically lost around twelve percent of its workplace jobs, mm-hmm. and it's been a pretty slow recovery. Um, and even today, ten years later, it hasn't recovered to pre recession levels. And one of the most shocking statistics about Rotherham is it doesn't have a single bike repair co-op. <laughs> Not one. <laughs> True sign of deprivation. <laughs> so it's it's gone from a region where the vast majority of people worked in manufacturing, well paid. 2008, 15% of jobs are in manufacturing. Most are in service sector, finance, banking, a little, little bit in the public sector. There's also just like a really, there's a mass exodus mm. in the area. They actually, one of the surprising things is people, people often cite migration as, as a source of tension within these communities. Um, the demographics of Rotherham is 94.8% white. Now, I'm not saying there aren't bigots and there aren't racists in Rotherham. Yeah. Uh, there are, you know, that's, that they've, they've cultivated and drawn on that base of support very effectively. But there's actually an exodus of mm. people from these towns, these neglected mm. towns, to cities where there are work. Yeah. And that this is a pattern that's replicated all the way great right across the north. So economically And a lot of them will be young people who are leaving. Absolutely. Yeah. So we have an we aging an aging business. population as well. Um, so economically the policies of the centre ground, to go back to the point you were making at the beginning, the policies of the centre ground, neoliberalism, mm. that traditionally privileged a a global uh, mobile form of manufacturing that privileged the service sector and finance and the city above those kind of industrial jobs has has absolutely wrecked these communities has deprived people of jobs 
has impoverished these people and has basically destroyed what what little working class community yeah. there was after the defeats of the the NUM strikes. Now, this is made even more problematic by the events of. Uh, well, uh, most people, when, when I mentioned Rotherham, most people know about know a bit because of the grooming scandal, yeah. which was this mm. horrendous incident where uh, gangs of men were basically uh, grooming young uh, working class girls and, 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 and a few boys um, into positions of sexual exploitation. A, a, like a, a truly horrendous situation. The council was was basically incompetent. Mm. Um, it has been widely ruled was was incredibly incompetent. Yeah. Um, the report that follows that incident is pretty damning. But the far right, because of the ethnicity of some of the people, some of the perpetrators, very effectively used that incident as a way of mobilising support mm. against the small Asian community, East Asian community um, that lives there so and labor fed into that as well you had the, yes yeah yes yeah yeah, yeah. and there, there was there was a certain degree of consensus i suppose mm. there was yeah, uh, definitely uh, uh, which was not helpful so far right had obviously done some stuff already there so i mentioned the bmp had had a foothold in there and actually marlene guest who was the bmp candidate a truly horrendous individual mm. a holocaust denier quite openly and on record as a Holocaust denier, um, was actually, believe it or not, in the Liberal Democrats what? <laughs> as a local activist. I don't know whether you can count that as a collapse in the centre ground. Wow. <laughs> wow. Um, I mean, why, why would she ever join the Liberals? Like, you just think, like, we're just looking for any political party? It was, yeah. And you'll do. Maybe it's just like, you know, you need to... Go to several projects before you find your your true, home. True, that's a good um, point. Yeah, yeah. Feel your way no, through it. Yeah, who yeah. knows? God, that is absolutely wild. So, but the thing that is interesting about her is she didn't run, obviously, on a platform of Holocaust denial, white supremacy, <laughs> or even particularly this kind of culture war stuff that mm. the BMP does later. If you watch her election videos, which unfortunately I have <laughs> caused some research in this, and you look at her election material, she runs on a platform of unemployment, deindustrialization, de and crime following from poverty. Right. Um, and it's basically making an economic proposition. Mm. You know, she's standing, this is an inter there's an interview with ITV News, and she's standing on a street, behind or in front of sorry a dilapidated council house mm. and saying look this is our community yeah. this is what's happening to us i am going to do something about it so obviously these people have uh, underneath uh, that agenda a deeply racist project mm. but the way she was saying herself to people was mm. for this economic bid now it's hard to tell what legacy that had but the combination of perhaps the far right being in the area already, maybe having some latent activism or latent sympathy, and then this grooming scandal means that the EDL, the English Defence League, when this happened, goes big time in Rotherham. So the statistics around this, are like particularly someone who lived nearby, I'm really quite shocked. You know, I that I, I knew stuff was going on in Rotherham. But the extent and scale of it is quite troubling. So 2012, the EDL held, held 16 protests in Rotherham over that year. And that including characters like Britain First mm. uh, being out and about, uh, you know, propagating a very sort of fascist, openly fascist mm. um, ideas. Uh, to, between 2014 to 15, there were a further 14 mass rallies, far right mass rallies in Rotherham. Rotherham Police Station was the was the site of a two week campsite vigil uh, yeah, against that. the police commissioner who they felt was responsible for the mm. corruption and um, incompetence that had led the grooming scandal to happen. That was police commissioner Paul Wright, and it it worked. They won. He resigned in two thousand fourteen. So the message that is being sent to this community, you've got they're doing they're doing they're doing the activity of the left. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're there. They're engaging with a community that is disillusioned, that that has had everything taken away from them, that politicians aren't speaking to effectively and, and has been abandoned by the centre. The far right swoops in and goes, you know what the problem is? It's all these migrants. And look, that's a problem as well. The police commissioner, completely corrupt, correctly incompetent, and we're going to get rid of him. And they get rid of him. Like they win. Mm. And that's really troubling. So, I mean, just just it's important to clarify, I think, that in terms of the grooming uh, scandal itself, the J report that was commissioned afterwards actually identified corruption, anti-working class sentiment and an unwillingness to offer the uh, particularly poor girls police protection as a more causal factor behind behind not acting than the ethnicity of the perpetrators yeah. that actually there was a widespread attitude within the council and the police that essentially poor working class girls were not deserving of protection that these people yeah. that is pretty i'm not going to repeat some of the things that were said about them but basically that they weren't really worthy of any kind of protection or 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 were well, even looking into the case in effect mm. and that had this misogynistic culture actually had a far more contributing culture to these things not being acted on yeah. that than fears about ethnicity of the perpetrators so i think it's important um to to get that straight but the reason i i get i i, I think it's important to reflect on that is that actually this could have been the terrain of the left mm. yeah. so that is a perfect yeah. left narrative right you've got a council that's incompetent that's corrupt, that's misogynistic, that is not protecting vulnerable working class girls in the context of a town that has been impoverished. And we gave it, or we left it, we gave it up to the far right through, I don't know, neglect, yeah. lack of interest, yeah. not not it, it not being a metropolitan hub where we live or where we have fled to. Um, and I think it's, it's damning. It really is damning. That's why I, I think it was important to look at it that actually, you know, as someone who lived near Rotherham uh, and someone who has worked there, I actually feel a little bit, you know, ashamed that we didn't do more. So, yeah, I think I think that's there's a lot there, obviously. And I just thought it was important to dig deep. Yeah, because actually. It is about rhetoric, you're right. It is about the language that's used and it is about the way people are presenting themselves now. But there are quite deep underlying things going on here. And I think it's understand yeah. it's important to understand what those are and how we speak to those things. And maybe that maybe you know, not to disagree with myself, or maybe I will. <laughs> <laughs> but like maybe that is maybe that's the point. You know, if you kind of scale up what happened in Rotherham mm. is it wasn't that the BMP particular or UKIP for that matter particularly had any real or meaningful political power. No, I would really. agree with you there. Yeah. Even ten percent, as shocking as that is, is not a par- is not a is not enough to change the political landscape. Yeah, is not that earthquake. Mm. You know, it, but it does mean that they're there yeah, and it means that they have that presence. Yeah. So that when that big news story breaks and when even the Labour MP, uh, Sarah Champion, blames blames particular ethnic groups for the abuse, they can jump on that because they're there and they're bedded in. They're not, you know, and maybe that's the most worrying element of this is that... Well, it's a taxi suite if preach, something, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Something, bedded bedded organisers yeah. are the most effective. Yeah. And it's, yeah, exactly. And that's and that's the worrying thing, isn't it? Because what happens when there's the next crisis of capitalism? Yeah. Because yeah. is, the, is the popular left bedded in as much as the popular right? I doubt that very much. Mm. Yeah. Um, and does it mean that, like in Rotherham, with the sex abuse scandals... And with the collapse of industry, they were ready to react to that because they were there. You could say the same for the right on a more global scale. 
more able to react because they're already there. Mm. And I think also can rely on a degree of common sense and media support Mm. that is kind of doing their work for them as well. Uh, I thought it was important to maybe add as a a pendant that when I was, I said to a friend of mine, who's a hope not hate organizer in Rotherham, Mm. that I was focusing on Rotherham. And I mentioned the the kind of trends and, and analysis that I was going through. He brought up the fact, and I think it's really important, that the fact that there's been a swing towards the Corbyn project does not resolve the underlying problems. That actually, Mm. clearly, just because people are offered economic propositions to make their lives better, doesn't it suddenly make them not bigots Mm. and not racists anymore? It opens a conversation, that conversation needs to be had. Yeah. And it's about engagement, isn't it? I mean that 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 was that was going to be my counter to that was yes no co- totally a swing towards a Corbyn left as positive as that is is not the end of a conversation it's the beginning of one yeah um and and that's one of the things that worries me about the reliance of of a Corbynite populism is is actually initially when you looked at it even with the rise of 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 Corbyn trade union membership for just as an example actually the decrease in membership actually increased in speed <laughs> you know so yeah. so it does it uh, you know it's like because they're all joining momentum yeah, the trade union they didn't have time for the revolution's coming yeah yeah exactly but it, it, yeah i can only go to one meeting a week yeah <laughs> i mean i get that to be fair i do get that fair but, enough it, yeah, yeah, it's totally fair enough. But um, it does it, it. You can't rely on that as a fix. Yeah. You can't rely on that as a fix. It has to be the beginning of it. But um, yeah, that feeds nicely on yeah. to the this next section. Thanks so much for doing that because I was a bit like, mm, not sure where <laughs> <laughs> how I'm going to start. Um, but yeah, well, we always do smooth segues. <laughs> yeah, segues it's beautiful. Thanks, <laughs> thanks for feeding me that line. I've just squandered it. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah. So I'm going to talk a bit about, um, I guess, like left populism, um, the sort of the argument that's made for it briefly, and then kind of why I disagree. I always disagree. That's, <laughs> that's my my brand on this podcast is just being disagreeable Um, but we've talked a bit about how um how populism is a kind of a return to more adversarial politics um so Chantal Mouffe has recently published this book uh called For a Left Populism and she identifies um sort of the decades of this kind of centrist consensus-based politics um is being the kind of the cause of this current like crisis of democracy that people are saying is you know obviously leading to the election of people like Trump and Bolsonaro in Brazil um so she's advocating um a return to a politics that sort of clearly delineates an us and a them um so we can see how the right wing has kind of taken this and run with it so in that formulation like us is white British people and men really like it's very masculine um and them is migrants people of color people that express solidarity with those groups um and the wild thing about this is that it allows someone like Jacob Rees-Mogg who's like a landowning millionaire to slag other people off as being elites this is like (laughs) obviously (laughs) completely ridiculous um They've attempted, like right wing populists have attempted to kind of reconstitute um, like the people and to include groups with like completely oppositional class interests. So, but like really, whatever like FBPE, um, Remainer, centrists, and liberals want to believe. By the way, like I am also not a Remainer, but somebody that voted Remain. Just. Mm. (laughs) Um, <laughs> um, it's You're like, not officially a Ramona, or <laughs> I'm not Ramona. I don't identify as a Romana. I did. Want to make that clear. 
I think those people like to talk about the kind of, you know, it being kind of uh, ill-educated working class people that caused Brexit. Like in reality, the people that pushed it over the line were southern middle class people. Um, Private renters and people with mortgages on the whole voted to remain. People that owned their homes outright, people so people that don't have mortgages, voted to leave. Um, And they did that like alongside social housing tenants. So the kind of the class interests maybe aren't quite as divergent as the kind of the popular wisdom or the kind of um, the FBPE centrists would uh, would have us believe. That's FBPE because I'm like extremely online. I should explain. That's slow <laughs> back pro EU. And it's yeah, like, I had to um, look that sorry, up. Sorry, sorry. Follow back. I don't follow even know what that is. So yeah. it's like a Twitter hashtag. You're, you're people... older than me. Don't don't talk to me like no, that. No, no. I I I didn't understand it either. I saw it all <laughs> over Twitter, and I was I had to Google it and try and understand what the hell was. And even then, it, it's, it's still a bit confusing. That's yeah. Amazing. It's just a weird hashtag that's used for people whose whole identity is about remaining in the EU, used to find each other. And tweeting. Uh, and yeah, when they're tweeting. Yeah. Oh my God. Um, yeah. I just threw up a little bit in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> it's really gross, the whole thing. Uh, but also hilarious. I'd spend a bit of time on FBP Twitter if you need to feel a bit better about yourself. Um, hashtag life hack. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, those, I think those, you know, those people like to talk about it being working class people that sort of caused Brexit. But actually, like what right wing populism is doing more than appealing to those people or as well as um, is appealing to white middle class property owning voters who are like full of resentment about being kind of left behind by what they perceive as like a more progressive culture, like this culture wars stuff, basically. Um, so if the left were going to kind of push their own, our own alternative to right wing populism, then us would then have to be like workers, all workers, all races, nationalities, genders, and obviously like including basically anybody who isn't a boss, whether or not they're working. Uh, with them being like the ruling class or the boss class. Um, People that kind of, people that support um, left-wing populism, like specifically a parliamentary project, um, would suggest that the us is kind of pulled together by an economic offering that speaks to, to their material interests. So like things like job creation through infrastructure projects and investment in public services generated by increased taxation for the rich. And the hope is that doing that, you'd kind of drag in everybody that would materially benefit from those policies, regardless of their broader politics around race, migration, gender or sexuality. And they'd hoped by doing that, they could create a large enough constituency to elect a left wing leader, like, for instance, Jeremy Corbyn. Um, I feel like very uncomfortable about this argument. I think um, we need a left that's like habitable for everybody, uh, that doesn't gloss over issues of race and migration and doesn't dismiss them as identity politics. Um, I totally agree that like that this that a lot of the kind of the rise of or the increased popularity of the Labour Party and people like people joining the Labour Party, I think is more interesting than people voting Labour. Um, you know, people are entering spaces where they can like have conversations about these issues and, um, you know, have their minds changed or, you know, learn. Um, but what I don't think is going to happen is that we're going to win over um these right-wing property owning reactionaries and i say we i am not a labor member which is probably going to become clear in a minute um (laughs) as as will my membership yeah (laughs) the episode ends with a fight to the death (laughs) um i think 
yeah, I mean, I think those people are this like this group of kind of middle class property owning, you know, landlords, a lot of them. Um, the depth of their resentment is uh, is is pretty incredible. And I like I just don't think we're. I don't they would rather see the economy tanked and migrants sent home like that's their that's their position. They weren't motivated to vote for Trump in America or for Brexit here because of like grinding poverty and years of austerity. Like, you know, like some people were, like Chris was talking about in Rotherham. Like you can see how people, like obviously people have been like completely let down. Like it's not possible for them really to like live under those conditions. These are, these are people who are fine um, and they're motivated by something that can't be like can't be offset by a left-wing economic offering. I think Labour seem to be quite aware of this. Um, and so they're kind of shoring up these like left-wing economic policies with um, ghoulish promises to employ more border guards and like deport migrants who are convicted of crimes more quickly. Um, I think like if a left parliamentary poli- like populist project of this sort, so you know left wing economic policies combined with like hostility to migrants and then a little sprinkle of social conservatism, if uh, if a project like that was to take power, they just couldn't expect to take like key parts of the working class with them. Like, um, you know, how can you expect migrants, especially migrants with like precarious status? Or, you know, pe- like queer people, anybody marginalised, how can they expect to take those people along with them? And I guess probably they they don't expect to take them with them, um, which for me is a, is a problem. I think another thing that I find disturbing about the kind of the... Um, this interest in left populism is the language, like we were talking about earlier, you often hear prominent sort of leftists like Corbyn, like the late, like the Labour leadership really, and, and people like Paul Mason, um, making use of the word elite. And elites is like it's become like a massive bugbear of mine. <laughs> um, they don't talk instead of talking explicitly like about class, they use the word elites which I think is such a mucky word with so much meaning and also so little meaning that it's actually a bit dangerous. I think it kind of enables a bit of a slippage between um, left and right. I think, you know, when Corbyn says elites, we can probably assume he means like Jacob Rees-Mogg or someone like Philip Green. Um, But there are prominent sort of blue labour trade unionists who, who use the word a lot. And they mean like metropolitan liberals, but like worse than that, they mean feminists, queer people, people of colour, migrants, anti-racists. Um, yeah, they kind of, they slip the meaning, don't they, to be, yeah. to mean people with a certain form of education yeah. or people with social power mm. or yeah. just people who tell yeah. me what to do. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's almost like um, there's two versions of class versus a culture war. There's class um, versus so your so your social your way of viewing society being based on class versus a culture war where that culture is immigration, etc., or culture based on versus sort of progressive culture versus um versus you know university educated you know it's it that that kind of view of two different ways of seeing the world is almost almost broad enough to cover anybody that isn't you isn't it because i I think because there's an opportunity i think that's being lost which is like increased class consciousness like Mm. if if people were clearer like and by people I mean like people like Corbyn and then people like Paul Mason who were like mm. people listen to and have a platform were clearer about like talking about talking explicitly and clearly about class 
like that would be i think a that would be useful but they don't they use the word elite instead and i think yeah they don't and it allows this slippage which i think is quite dangerous and there's like a couple of weird things about that word as well that like are mainly just feelings that i have but are maybe worth mentioning which is like i think the people that um the people that certain parts of the kind of the blue labor left are talking about when they use that word they're positioned as like oppositional to this like desired culture of like white masculinity white masculinity so there's something about the word that like speaks to a really strong resentment of anything like feminine or queer that this is like weird idea that like just like being a woman or being queer is like inherently like elitist I don't know it's an odd one um and also that like I think that is also where anti-semitism lives like the word elites kind of stirs up this kind of conspiracy theory stuff which gives you know often gives rise to anti-semitism and I do think that some of I do think that this is maybe one of the reasons that we see this like quite complicated anti-semitism like crisis or I don't know whatever you want to call it in labor at the moment I think it isn't helped by this slippage and this use of unclear language and I think they're missing an opportunity to talk very like explicitly about class um yeah I mean I understand the pull of like populist movements like it feels like oh if we did this we could maybe win and that would be nice like it'd be nice to win (laughs) be nice to forget (laughs) about like all the like contradictions and challenges and all of those things um and just you know be on top but um I don't think it's like viable or desirable like it's not an alternative I don't think to like grassroots mass movement building Mm. um I mean on on that particular point and especially in terms of what you're saying about the difficulties of using that I think you you unpack it very well in terms of it being problematic for many many reasons but one of the big blind spots that tailoring your social change entirely around this idea of elites is actually certainly in in terms of my own experience as a trade union organizer and activist in the IWW in NEU the people that cause my members and my workmates the most stress anxiety and bother are not elites Mm. Mm. you know they're actually the the thing that causes people the most issues day to day is the structure of their workplaces yeah Yeah. and and the management that they have to interact with and actually just saying oh it's the rich bastards at the top yeah this is the fact that the organization of society is also making people profoundly miserable and is the source of our problems Yeah. yeah absolutely and i actually also perhaps misses that that experience is also radicalizing if used yep. in the correct way that as an organizer someone with discontent anger and frustration with work could be transformed into something profoundly transformative mm-hmm. through collective yeah. action and I'm, I'm going to do a second marxist oh yeah oh nice no. gonna do two two in one day and more importantly Treat yourself. more importantly <laughs> that economic power is the transformative lever of, of changing society yeah. It, yeah by 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 initiating social change at the point mm-hmm. of production distribution and exchange that's how social and political change happens yeah mm-hmm. i mean I, I i always find myself in a weird position because ultimately you know as you would have hoped from the name of our media project, <laughs> I am obviously a syndicalist. But despite that, I am also a Labour Party activist. And it is always an interesting contradiction, maybe in my own politics, that um, absolutely I see the real way to change pe- to for people to, you know, change for themselves, to improve their own lives, is through strength in their own workplace, through... Yeah organizing with their workmates absolutely but but you know i think changing making a change to the overall you know political picture on a national level matters and that's and you know that's why 
engaging with parliamentary politics i don't feel is contradictory but you know I, the difficulty the difficulty i have with you is that ultimately i agree with everything that you said <laughs> <laughs> you know that, that is the real difficulty you know you <laughs> there isn't enough there isn't enough discussion of class there isn't enough discussion of class politics it really it really does weaken the argument for a progressive labor force when they don't talk about uh class enough and actually um and i think it kind of echoes back to our early discussion about the language of socialism having that strength in the 1930s mm. because That's it was a moral phrase force. moral force yeah, i think he's absolutely right force. yeah that yeah. is absolutely lacking from left populism today in the UK, in the UK context, to stress in the UK context, you know, that is there. And there's sort of like there's nods and winks to it because because obviously the they know that that is their base and that is what keeps them in power in the party. But it is only nods and winks. There isn't there needs to be more of an emphasis in pushing that forward as a real political force for a moral change in direction. Um and unfortunately, I think the anti-Semitism argument brings that out in the Labour Party because people don't want to have a serious conversation about every everyday racism, about uh, the fact that then, you know, it doesn't matter how fucking right on you are or how uh, cool your list of books in your house is or whatever. It, it, it doesn't matter. You're still capable of being racist in some way or saying something that you shouldn't and actually there is going to be anti-semitism in the labor party because there is anti-semitism everywhere and we have to face up to that and have real serious discussions about it if we want to be that moral force Hmm. and um, you know it needs that needs to be something that changes inside the labor party as much as anything else but you know that's maybe because I'm a glutton for punishment. I'll keep on going back and trying to do that. <laughs> yeah, I thought you were just going to give empty platitudes. I'm quite impressed you put forward a, a oh. robust defence. I thought you were sorry, say, sorry, you what? Made, I thought you were trading his part. Oh, Jeremy <laughs> Corbyn. Oh, that was my second point. That was my second point. My second point is Lydia. I hate you. I can't believe you said anything. But bad Jez about, is coming round with the bag of for the lads. Yeah, Jez, Jez is bringing me some jam later and. Uh, me and Paul Mason are going to talk about how the aliens need to have a people's bomb. And sorry, that's a really needlessly niche comment about Paul Mason. For anyone who didn't know, Paul Mason used to prescribe to a particular political belief called Padaism. Pasadism. Pasadism. Yeah. yeah. One of the key beliefs was of that particular political strain was that uh, the answer to uh, the world being on the edge of a nuclear apocalypse was to have a people's bomb yeah they also believe aliens would be communists as well oh yeah no that was it as well. that was that was where the alien thing comes in i always yeah. forget that bit yeah he also didn't he also write like one or two disturbingly sexy books like, oh, I, yeah, oh my god, I, I think he's written some like borderline erotic fiction as well oh my god i'm so into that <laughs> i'm i'm buying that right now <laughs> he did write a really good book called um uh live working or die fighting that's such a very good book yeah. sorry this is becoming a book review now <laughs> yeah. it's, it is a great book about uh about everyday stories of of resisting and everyday stories of struggle so yeah. interesting book but my point is you know I, I i there is a there is a real need that if we want to engage with left populism and if we want to have a left populism you know, you know, we need to have a discussion about whether that's something we'd want. But if we do want a left populism, it does. It has to be a moral force. It can't just be. It can't just be the same old parliamentary jiggery pokery. Yeah. It has to be. Or do some, what the far right does, yeah. but, but yeah. swap some of the words and yeah, pieces. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 It has or to not even, make... you know, like not even swapping the words, like just allowing them to kind of uh, just, you know get all squashed together in a disgusting mess that allows like you know i mean some of the stuff that i read when i was writing this was just like you know extremely disturbing to hear like people from you know people that describe describe themselves as socialists literally writing like oh if you say that a uh 
um, a child should have parents of two different genders, you'll get shouted at, and that's wrong. Like, you know, this is the kind of shit that these people are coming out with. Yeah. Um, and, it, you know, it's just, that's indistinguishable from something that somebody on the right would say. Yeah. Exactly. Like, it's just, it's the same message. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I suppose it's that unwillingness to challenge common sense, to mm. kind of fight the culture war on the right yeah. sides and yeah. try to abstain from that. And that's just not going to work. Mm. It's just not going to work. Yeah. These economic, like we said before, these economic propositions start conversations. They do not solve the problem. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I'm very much with you, Lydia. I don't think the solution to the kind of challenges that Rotherham face is going in, aping what the EDL and BNP are saying, but saying, bring back all the coal mines. Yeah. Yeah, I'm saying, yeah. yeah, I'm saying we need to engage. Dave's skeptical about that point. <laughs> I'm saying we need to uh, about the comments. Yeah, yeah, I should yeah. clarify. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the about yeah, it's about engagement and having those dialogues and having those conversations. I mean, I think they should just build loads of factories. Just love factories. Well, they do. They have quite a high tech manufacturing base. It just doesn't employ many people, More which factories. again is a problem with British mm, manufacturing. That's, that's a problem. More yeah. shit jobs. More shit jobs. But, like on a larger scale. <laughs> The problem is there isn't enough like guys walking around in overalls anymore. That's, that's, where that's you the problem. That's yeah. what I miss. <laughs> or maybe that's just what I find attractive. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> it's, it's a really hard call. <laughs> I mean, just to, just to kind of, I know we've, we've spent a lot of time and we probably ought to, to bring it to a close soon, but in terms of this fraught relationship between syndicalism mm -hmm. or, or just trade unions and mm -hmm. political parties, um, Obviously, that's been played out for a number of different theories and ideolog ideological sort of schemes and ways of approaching it. But I think there were certainly people who had a very radical vision of what trade unions could achieve mm -hmm. and also were simultaneously open to the idea that political parties could be used pragmatically to open up a certain course. Mm -hmm. um, Big Bill Hayward is maybe an interesting example not necessarily advocating that point of view but just an interesting example that someone who felt it was absolutely necessary that the, the the base of power of working people was their union and that strong unions were the lever of of, of true social change but also recognized that the political sphere could maybe be used occasionally to pragmatically support or open up space for those projects the reality of that was kind of basically sitting awkwardly in both projects, mm. Mm. you know, in, in the industrial workers of the world, his union in the States viewed quite suspiciously mm. and um, with animosity by the more anti-state anarchist elements within this socialist party seen as an anarchist and a syndicalist mm. and anti-state. Mm. Maybe that's OK. Yeah, that's an OK yeah. place to be. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that is exactly where I sit. That's it. I'm just... <laughs> A more modern interpretation. You just need though. to lose your eye in a mining accident now, and then. I mean, I would we're... prefer not to. But, <laughs> I mean, if it is absolutely necessary, then you know, we all have to, we all have to make sacrifices. And then die of alcoholism in Russia. I mean, that probably will happen. You do get buried in in the in Red Square though, which is quite nice. Oh, cool. All right, no, worth yeah. it. Worth yeah. it. That's fine. No, I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I really feel like, you know, it. I just feel like we ignore the political sphere at our peril. And I know that's not the position you're advocating, mm. but but our, our, I kind of come back to other examples. <clears throat> I know we've talked about this in previous podcasts, but when the Occupy movement uh, really sort of kicked off and a lot of the left ignored it and just sort of poo-pooed it and were like, oh, you know, that's, that's just, you know, not something to be involved in. It's not proper politics, etc. It by ignoring these things, I feel like we miss a chance to influence them and also to recruit. To be blunt, as well, yeah. you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with going into those spheres and being like, "This is who I am. This is my radical politics." I realise it might not always be popular, mm -hmm. but you will find other people in those spheres who buy into that same perspective, and yeah. it is an opportunity to build build the strength to push for. Um, a different kind of populism and a different kind of uh, strength in a political sphere as well as as well as in the economic. Yeah, I mean the reality is, is if we think 
if we think unions are the key to mm. transforming societies Absolutely. and improving people's lives, then we need to be there arguing mm. that yep. simply. And if we're yeah. within, you know, not necessarily standing up in Parliament arguing for that, I'm not sure that would be that helpful, but actually within within movements and within parties and within all organisations arguing that case and yeah. bringing people closer. In one big union. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Great idea. <laughs> <laughs> Should we bring it to a close? Yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah. So our next podcast um, will be coming out in a few weeks' time. Um, apologise for the delay in getting this one out. We've been focused on uh, our uh, uh, attendance down at Loughborough University. You would have seen the interview, uh, the recording of our presentation there gone out a few weeks ago um and we should be bringing out a video of our interview also at loughborough university um so thank you for listening and uh, listening to our nonsense and uh, we'll be uh, we'll be speaking to you again soon bye, bye. bye. Thank, you. thank you for listening to talking shop a podcast by new syndicalist for trade union activists and organizers If you'd like to listen to previous episodes or review our other content, please check out our website, newsyndicalist.org. You can also keep updated on future episodes by subscribing to our podcast via Acast, iTunes or Stitcher. While you're there, why not leave us a review to help us find more people like yourself? If you have a suggestion for future content, would like to submit your own ideas or would like to discuss any of the ideas raised in this or previous episodes, please contact us at newsyndicalist at gmail.com. Thanks again. Bye.